Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for standing by. Welcome to the Role of Information Governance in Legal Hold and Preservation, Part 1 webinar. During the presentation, all participants will be in a listen-only mode. If you would like to ask a question during the presentation, please use the chat feature located in the lower left corner of your screen. If you need to reach an operator at any time, please press star zero. As a reminder, this conference is being recorded Thursday, August 15th, 2013. I would now like to turn the conference over to Robin Thompson. Please go ahead, ma'am. Hi, everyone. I'm Robin Thompson, and on behalf of our team here at BIA, we want to welcome you to our August Knowledge Leadership Webinar, where we will be talking with our industry experts about the role of information governance and records management in preservation and hold. Very quick housekeeping items. As Andre said, if you have questions for our expert, please put them in the chat window, and we will queue those up to be answered at the end of the program. Second, as you leave today, you'll be prompted to answer a short survey. We use your feedback to plan our educational programs and to improve our services and products for the industry. Now, my favorite part of today is welcoming our distinguished speakers. Johnny Zaza heads the information management practice at Ramon. He is one of the country's foremost experts on RIM issues, e-discovery, and legal holds. He, and he is internationally recognized in the emerging legal fields of information governance as well as records and information management. He is not only a licensed attorney, but also carries the honor of having been inducted into the Company of Fellows of ARMA International for his positive contributions in ethics, professional responsibility, and professional standards. As many of you know, John is a prolific author and the co-author of the Seven Steps for Legal Holds of ESI and other documents. As a valued attendee of BIA Knowledge Leadership Webinars, I want to give you some exciting news. If you will write us at education at BIA Protect, John has graciously offered a 10% discount without having one on my nightstand because it is a critical part of our business. Alon Israeli leads the Strategic Partnerships for Business Intelligence Associates. Alon has spent the last 15 years advising law firms and corporations on compliance, e-discovery, and information security, and served as an expert witness on numerous computer forensics, digital evidence management, and data security. Alon is not only a licensed attorney, but an IT professional who carries the distinguishment of being a certified information systems security professional. The unique perspective he brings to his presentations has made Alon one of the most sought after speakers in our field. And it is my great privilege to turn this program over to John Azaza. Great, thank you so much, uh, Robin, for the uh, kind words and the introduction. And I have no doubt that the reason you keep that book on your nightstand is because it's safer than Ambien or any other uh, sleep medication. <laughs> but <laughs> anyway, so. Um, uh, our, I'm going to set our agenda today, and then I'm going to turn it over to Alon to actually walk us through uh, basically setting the baseline uh, language, because sometimes legal, RIM, and IT speak a different language. Um, along with that, Alon will present uh, the essential participants in the discovery process, and he's going to really take us into the weeds a little bit uh, of addressing the mechanics of gathering data in the e-discovery in e process. And then he's going to turn it over back to me, and then I'm going to step up to a 30,000-foot level and really walk you through the step, seven steps for legal holds as part of the overall information governance strategy that will tie very nicely into the weeds that, uh, that um, Alon will be taking you into. So with that, I'll turn it over to Alon. Thanks, John. <clears throat> um, so yeah, you know, I, I just figured uh, as a, uh, I'm both an attorney and a technologist, so I'm going to put my attorney hat on now and uh, I think we all have seen a, a document by an attorney, a contract that's 20 pages long of which, you know, the first 10 are definitions. And so that's what I'm going to do here. I'm, I'm definitely not going to give you 10 slides of definitions, but I thought the best thing to do is to make sure that we're on the same page, both from a process perspective as well as a language perspective. And, 
you know, what we're, we're looking at here is the EDRM. I think that probably most of you are familiar with this. It's an industry standard model. It really walks us through kind of what happens uh, with respect to a document life cycle related to litigation or regulatory uh, matters. And you can't really see the right side because it's covered by the, the big red uh, attorney's box. But the point here is that the attorneys really handle uh, that, that part of the process that gets into the substantive aspects of, of, of what you may be dealing with in the matter. And so they are going to do review and production and, and deposition prep and all of that, where you know, the IG professionals, the RIM folks, we really are on the left side of things. And really what does that mean? That means that everything having to do with what happens at the corporate level, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a second. But if you notice here across the CDRM, most of the steps uh, from you know, information management, which is just kind of having an understanding of your systems uh, at the corporate level, all the way through identification and, and legal hold and, and gathering of data and getting it ready for the attorneys, that's really all the responsibility of the organization, of the corporation. And so you know, that's a great place to start because it just gives you a sense as to where uh, the role is for the organization and where the role is for the attorneys. So let's talk a little bit about language. Custodians is what a lawyer will call uh, a person. A user is what an IT may call a person. Employee is what a manager or an information governance uh, professional is going to call a person. But at the end of the day, we're talking about people. And really what we're doing here is we're making sure that people understand their obligations when it comes to preserving data or preserving information for legal purposes. And it really it's about the people. I mean, of course the systems play a part. You want to ensure systems are not overriding or, or deleting, de doing this kind of thing. Uh, but at the end of the day, it really does come down to the people, whether that's the people managing the process uh, or the people involved in, uh, in having to certify that they're in fact preserving data. Legal hold, you know, I like to put here uh, this one because legal hold many times, if, especially if you're focused on the EDRM, or if you're uh, kind of steeped in the e-discovery world, you might think of legal hold as just one part of the process that is the notification part, letting people know that they uh, are obligated to retain documents. But really we need to think of legal hold in a little bit of a more broad sense. And really it's about notifying people, but then the follow-on to that is ensuring that you've actually gathered the documents or that you've preserved the data. So it's not good enough to just tell people to preserve but you have to take some steps in order to actually to do the actual uh, data preservation. The one thing I would add here is that legal hold is sometimes referred to as a litigation hold or a preservation hold. So there are different monikers for the legal hold process. Um, so just keep that in mind. Yep, good point. <clears throat> and uh, and you know th again, language is important. Data, you know, as, as IT people, as technologists. I've always really just called everything data. Um, maybe uh, you, you li listen to some lawyers or they'll talk about documents. Of course, lawyers had to complicate things even more with the addendum to the rules a few years ago and they've turned the simple word data into ESI, electronically stored information. Of course, it's a more broad definition of data. Or, and then um, on the RIM side, you know, you could think of them as possible records, and maybe John, you could talk a little bit about about the difference. Sure. Yeah. So in the in the legal world, when we refer to documents or or ESI, we're really referring to anything that's in your systems that could potentially be relevant um, to a lawsuit um, or a technically uh, reasonably calculated to lead to the discovery of admissible evidence. So. Uh, in the legal world, documents has a much broader sense. In the records and information management world, the word records is a defined term, which really takes us into basically all the data that is used to capture the decision of the company as a business record at the end of the day. The reason we make this distinction is because for records managers, you, when, when somebody seeks documents or when a lawyer asks you for records, they mean documents. They don't mean what you've been defining as a record when in the e-discovery space. 
Um, that distinction for the, uh, the word record is, 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 a, is uh, important in defending your disposition of records and why records don't exist, why certain data doesn't exist anymore. But if the data is there or the documents are there, then anything within the systems will be uh, discoverable. Yeah, and I think the important distinction that, that John uh, referred to there is that, uh, you know, and we're talking about language here, lawyers will say, go get me all those records. And it's very important as a, as a RIM professional to, to make sure you understand that they're using that term loosely in that particular context. Um, and then just to kind of finalize, data collections, what do we mean by that? We mean securing the data. Um, and, and that's really ensuring that you have a set or a copy of the data that can be used uh, as the pristine repository of evidence. So some organizations may lock data down in place. As an IT uh, professional, I'm less inclined for, to that method. It causes a lot of uh, agita, uh, depending upon the systems you have. Uh, but whether it's locking the data in place where it, where it exists, or actually making a, a defensible or forensic copy of that, uh, that, that's really what we mean by data collections, is, is having set aside some version of the document that is pristine and that you can show, hey, this is what it looked like and this is what it, uh, uh, the manner in which it was situated at the time we collected it or at the time that we put the preservation in place. So there's just some language that we can use uh, to make sure that we're all on the same page and, and that, uh, you know, as, and you'll hear me jump around with, with uh, some terminologies and so uh, just to get you a sense is a lot of times we mean the same thing when we use different words. So let's talk a little bit about what preservation is from a, a, an organizational perspective. You know, in, in a nutshell, it's what happens on CorpNet, to be a little geeky about it. This is everything happening behind the firewall, so to speak, if we want to be a little bit more traditional. Of course, today the firewall is virtual, so it has a lot of different meanings. Uh, but it's really that, that distinction between the responsibility at the organizational level and the responsibility at the law firm or, or the lawyering level the outside counsel, so to speak. And then in kind of plain English here, what is preservation? It's notifying people, identifying and gathering stuff, and ensuring that the IT or RIM housekeeping type tasks are, are not breaching any preservation duties. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, but that's, uh, for example, automated IT tasks. Uh, for example, anything that may relate to uh, uh, records management definitions, uh, disposition of data, so for, uh, uh, you know, a good example is always email. Organizations will say you have up to 500 megs or a gig of email in your mailbox, and every 90 days, anything beyond that will get deleted, and so you as a user have to ensure that you're preserving uh, those records, uh, RIM version of records, or any document, frankly, that you think is important. Uh, and so it's important that a good part of this legal whole process is to ensure that some automated IT task doesn't do its thing and then breach uh, uh, the duty of preservation that you've worked so hard to put in place uh, with the people. And we'll go into a little bit more detail. You know, preservation is really all that stuff, all of those activities, all of that task that occur as early on in the matter as possible. I think, uh, you know, for a long time we were using the anticipation of litigation, but you mentioned the other day now Sedona has a, a new definition they're, they're kind of looking at. Yeah, they're, um, they're proposing um, credibly probable, uh, which is to me a, a higher standard. Um, there is still some debate around it, but I have seen it uh, quoted in at least one case. Um, so it depends on the jurisdiction that you're in. So it could go anywhere from uh, reasonably anticipated to credibly probable or somewhere in between. Uh, threatened, uh, reasonably, credibly threatened might be another consideration, but that unfortunately, and we'll be discussing this during my seven right. steps, unfortunately is one of those things where you have to look into a crystal ball. Yeah, and, and, and definitely talk to a lawyer, I think, at that point, because it's going to be probably related very much to the merits of that specific case and the organization and, and the industry and that kind of thing. Um, and so it's, it's that stuff that happens early on, but then it's also the, the inv making sure that the right people are involved, and I talk a little bit about the team approach, uh, ensuring that the legal department, IT, the RIM folks, everybody's playing the key role, that critical role that they're supposed to be playing in this process. And just kind of to finish it off, you know, again, bringing back that EDRM, 
you see here the four main points, ensuring that you have notification and acknowledgement. The acknowledgement of that, and I think John you'll talk a little bit about that, is very important because it's not good enough to just tell people to not delete or to preserve, but you want to have some uh, way of tracking that, especially at medium and large organizations. We really can't uh, you, you really can't have an excuse and say, well, we sent the emails and we don't know who got them and whether people actually um, and and uh, and the right systems that may be that may be uh, uh, relevant or maybe implicated by the case or the matter. And then IT task management that I briefly spoke about is, is ensuring those certain automated IT tasks are suspended, like the automatic deletion of email, for example, and then just tapping it with the ability to secure the data to create a defensible copy that is not drag and drop. Uh, so actually either using a solution that is specifically designed to do uh, data preservation or just utilizing the right methods and ensuring that you are not deleting uh, metadata and that you're not changing information like its location while you're doing the actual uh, data collection or the securing of the information. And so again, you know, preservation more broadly defined is really all that, all that activity that happens on the left side of the EDRM, although George Soshi doesn't like me to break it up into left and right. And so really all of those things that happen early in the, in the document life cycle around litigation or legal matters. And so just uh, as a summary again, those four main points, if you walk away with anything at that kind of in, in the mud uh, understanding of, of what needs to happen, it's these four things letting people know that of their obligations, identifying those people in the systems that may be relevant, ensuring the automated tasks are, are suspended, and then uh, gathering the documents in the right way. So let's talk a little bit about the essential participants in the process. You know, if, you, if you've ever wondered whether uh, RIM professionals, uh, information governance professionals play a role, I can tell you they very much do. And what we've done is really kind of spearheaded by Robin, who introduced us. She and her team have gone through and really went and tried to find different ads uh, that are out there. And you'll find that here are ads asking for, uh, for records manage manager people. And you, know, you have in these ads uh, discussions of uh, e-discovery. Uh, I can't really, uh, I can't really draw here, but e-discovery, e uh, preservation. I'm not going to go through each one of these, but the point is that more and more these are becoming relevant. Is you know, RIM folks, IG professionals are very much a part of the preservation and the e-discovery process. And what does that mean at the end of the day? It means that the records information management professionals inside of an organization are really the ones that ensure the compliance is met. At the end of the day, I think that both John and I agree that uh, over the next few years you'll find that, that really information governments and RIM professionals own this part of e-discovery. Like I personally think they're going to own almost all of e-discovery, at least that, that, that part of e-discovery that happens on the corporate side. And more and more we're finding that RIM really does own and oversees the preservation of documents. And it really makes most sense that they do. They are the kind of keepers of records and documents in the organization. They ensure which ones need to be held and which ones can get deleted. And if you think about it, legal hold or, or data preservation for legal circumstances or legal matters is really just a subset of that record keeping. It just happens to be a record particular to a, 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 an incident. Um, but really, that, that's really where things are going. And in fact, John and I are speaking at ARMA, and John's going to talk a little bit of, uh, about that a little bit more. We're going to be at ARMA International in a couple months, and uh, we're doing a workshop as well as some panels specifically around uh, the information government professional's role in uh, e-discovery, and particularly legal hold and preservation. So I think uh, beyond just the two of us, you'll find most people will probably agree, most uh, professionals in this field will probably agree that that's where it's going. E-discovery will be owned uh, by those folks in the organization, and we see it moving there. We see IT is very much involved, but ultimately, I think the buck will stop at the at, at the IG's desk, so to speak. So, how do we get it started off right? We make sure that we have a team approach. We follow a written plan. We answer the who, what, where, why, and how. We involve key players. You know, this sounds more complicated than it is, whether you're a small, medium, or large organization. Maybe it's only two or three people. Maybe it's five or six or ten people. 
But this is not only a team that you want to have from a, 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 a reactionary perspective, but these are folks that want maybe should get together uh, once a quarter or a couple times a year in order to ensure that the overall process is being followed. And uh, John's going to get into, into that high level. Those are the high level stuff are the kinds of things that this team is going to really want to have in their back pocket. Frankly, these pe people on this team should definitely have that book. Uh, whether it's on their nightstand or, 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 uh, or on their bookshelf in their office. And a little bit more about the team approach. You want to involve employees. We're finding more and more uh, courts are looking specifically to see whether uh, lawyers and the organization is involving the employees because frankly the custodians, the employees, they know where they keep their data. And then together with involving employees, you want to make sure that the attorneys are supervising the process, both at a relatively detailed level as well as at a high level. This doesn't mean that the lawyer has to sit shotgun while the IT guy goes and, and exports data out of a, a mail system. What it does mean, though, is that the lawyer has to be involved in ensuring those, these are the systems we're going to, this is the kind of data that we want, this kind of stuff. Alon, there's been um, there's some uh, chatter about the voice breaking up, so I'm going to give you the, the headpiece and see if maybe that Okay. Hopefully this will be a little bit better for everyone. So first response. This is a very important part of the process, especially when you have a matter hit or you have the anticipation of a matter. And so you want to make sure that you are identifying the right people. That's usually the first step anyway. And that you are drafting the right memos and that you have that acknowledgement side of it. So it's not okay just to notify people, but you definitely want to have them acknowledge that they've received and they understand the notice that you've sent. And then you want to identify data sources. You want to do what's called the implicated, implicated systems analysis where you're asking what systems may be relevant here. We all know that email and data off people's laptops and workstations and in their home folders are pretty much going to be a part of every case these days. But what about the CRM? What about the wiki? What about the source control system? There are a lot of other systems inside of an organization uh, that may be implicated, and you want to look to see if they, if they are specifically with that matter. Now, part of that first response, of course, is again, if you remember those four points, managing those automated tasks, ensuring that they're not overriding data that you need to preserve, and then, of course, gathering that data, doing that in the right way, keeping chain of custody, make sure you're following the same consistent protocol every time. Don't drag and drop. Use uh, either commercial system or a process that is defensible. This is a, a, a great quote out of the Judge's Guide to Cost-Effective E-Discovery. I, I love looking just at the name of this, uh, uh, you know, of this guide, the Judge's Guide to Cost-Effective E-Discovery. This just goes to show that everything is really driven by costs. And the better, are, better you are with the process, more efficient, more consistent, the more costs will go down. Here the guide is specifically saying you want to involve knowledgeable client personnel. And so this is, goes to that notion of a team approach. There are some case law. There's some case law. I'm going to kind of quickly run through these. Uh, if you have a chance, come to Vegas in a couple months, and uh, John and I will go through these in much more detail. Uh, but uh, just a couple I want to mention. You know, it's ma make sure that the lawyers are supervising, uh, and that the uh, that the users or the employees are not doing the work on their own. They need to be involved in designating what may be relevant or what may be important. But you don't want the user to actually go into their email, go onto their laptop, and start moving stuff around and sticking it in a folder for you to then go collect. So you want to really make sure that you bifurcate the designation with the mechanics of the actual collection. And it's important to scope the right technology for the right situation. In this case, you, know, you want to make sure that um, you are utilizing the right tool set and the right mechanics. And so for example, if you have a criminal case or a highly sensitive case or maybe an HR case, maybe you want to do a full drive image because maybe you're going to have to go for the deleted stuff. Or maybe you're going to want to uh, do an analysis of where uh, people may have browsed before they left the organization or, or what might have been copied to a USB key. And so in that case, you want to do a full drive imaging. Or if it's a civil case, uh, then likely you're okay just doing a surgical collection, a defensible logical or live data collection. So this is really about ensuring that you scope the right technology for the particular situation.
and then just kind of end with this notion of balancing custodian involvement, in involving users, involving employees, and also making sure the attorneys are supervising. You have those two things together, and you have a gold standard process there where both the attorneys and the employees uh, are getting together to ensure that everything uh, that may be relevant is indeed being preserved. Okay, thank you, Alon. And so um, hopefully we've resolved uh, some of the uh, sound issues by switching to the headpiece. Uh, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to walk you through the um, seven steps. Uh, as you see, um, as you heard, um, Alon gave us a lot of uh, basically minimum guidelines that we should follow to make sure that we have a defensible process. Now what I'd like to do is turn this into a high-level 30,000-foot view that is incorporated into your entire information governance program, and that is to adopt a seven steps for um, legal holds uh, process. <clears throat> Before we start, though, I'd like to um, show you this slide as to what is a hold policy. And the reason I bring up this slide, it's not so much because I don't think that you know what a hold policy is by now, but, uh, but more to illustrate that this language that you see in front of you was something that we negotiated for about four weeks with the client back and forth to define what the legal hold should be. So this is actual language that you can really just kind of cut and paste um, right out of, uh, of out of this this slides and and uh, insert it into your into your um, policies. One thing that I would do, do want to point out, and uh, Alon alluded to this earlier, was this issue about what's considered. Um, uh, reasonably anticipated or foreseeable. And um, as I mentioned earlier, Sedona does propose, instead of uh, reasonably anticipated, they do propose uh, credibly probable, and there's a couple of cases out there that are quoting that same language as, as far as anticipating whether a lawsuit is occurring. Uh, when we negotiated this particular policy, um, it wasn't so much this section that, that we were having issues with, it was this section that really caused us the most headaches. So again, we're going to need to develop a process around it. So what does that process look like? <clears throat> what you see in front of you is, is basically the, with the process that we uh, recommend uh, in the book, Seven Steps for Legal Holds. And you begin with, uh, with uh, determining whether a triggering event has occurred. A uh, triggering event could be, if you're an automobile manufacturing company, for example, a triggering event could be something as simple as uh, a vehicle where the brakes uh, are not working properly. Uh, the question then is, is, it, uh, is, does the triggering event occur the very first time a vehicle um, has failure with the brakes, or is it when 100 vehicles have the same problem, 1,000 vehicles? So that's when we need to determine whether that's where we need to start monitoring if a triggering event has occurred. To do all this and to really manage all these seven steps, what you really need is this implementation, this, this oversight committee. This is really an important, uh, the most important part of this process, which is to really have some, uh, a, a group of people, uh, experts. Uh, you've got the folks from legal, folks from records management, uh, folks from IT, and really any other key uh, functions within your organization that are actively monitoring, implementing, uh, training, auditing, and just tracking whether or not there's any triggering events that actually result in, in a duty to preserve, which will be step number two. And just as importantly, releasing these legal holds, which comes under step number seven, because we want to make sure that we um, lift this data from, from, uh, from the legal hold so that it can be disposed of if it's already expired pursuant to your ret retention schedule and so that you don't get into a, a cascading legal hold dilemma. So going back to the seven steps again, if a triggering event has occurred, um, then the next, uh, 
step would be to analyze whether or not that triggering event rises to the level of having to preserve at that point. If the answer is no, uh, obviously preservation is not required at this time. And the next se several slides will walk you through each of these steps so that you have a better sense of what's considered a triggering event or what is not. But obviously, if there is no duty to preserve, nothing needs to be, uh, uh, nothing is required to be preserved. And but I would recommend that as part of this implementation process and this oversight process, that you make sure that you are uh, monitoring uh, at least uh, for another year uh, whether or not a matter rises to the level of being a, um, a, a something that requires preservation. After you've analyzed the duty to preserve, and if the answer is yes, then you're going to define the scope. And this is where you're going to get into uh, determining uh, how many people within the organization it could apply. You're going to be analyzing uh, the potential complaint or the actual complaint to determine how uh, wide a net you need to cast for the documents that could be relevant and responsive in this lawsuit. One thing to keep in mind, and I'm going to be discussing this a little bit later, is that uh, the scope not, doesn't apply just to you as a, as a defendant in a lawsuit, but it could also apply to you as a plaintiff in the lawsuit. And we're going to be discussing uh, the Rambis uh, decisions, for example, as examples where Rambis was the one bringing the lawsuit and they got into trouble uh, when it came to the scope issue. Uh, once you've determined the scope, then it's time to get into what Alon was really talking about, implementing that hold, uh, making sure that, uh, that you preserve the information. So as he pointed out, uh, it's not the legal hold is not just simply sending out a notice, but actually making sure that the data is preserved, and that's what implementing the hold is all about. Along with that, step number five is to enforce and examine that hold. In other words, making sure that the folks in IT understand which systems need to be um, turned off or, or altered to make sure that there isn't any overwriting of, database, of data or any deletion of data that's uh, set for automatic uh, disposition to suspend the destruction pursuant to your retention schedule and so on and so forth. And then, of course, uh, after that, you're going to be modifying. In fact, steps number five and number six can, can actually work uh, very closely because you, once you get into the lawsuit, you may have a better sense of uh, how, how the, the litigation is going down and whether or not certain causes of action have been dropped, new causes of action have been added, new parties have been added, uh, parties have been dropped from the lawsuit. And as all these things occur, you may be able to modify the legal hold and not preserve as much information. Really, the, the goal of this oversight and this entire seven-step process is to just uh, really be as laser focused as possible while at the same time be compliant with what the other parties are requesting and with what the court orders are. And then finally, you're going to monitor and remove those holds along with modifying. You're going to be making sure that this oversight committee and your, and your counsel immediately notify you if something, if a legal hold has been lifted so that you can lift the hold and dispose of the data if it's already expired in accordance with the retention schedule, or if it wasn't a record in the first place, it can be disposed of immediately as long as it's not relevant to another anticipated or credibly probable lawsuit. There's a great question that just came up. Uh, so reasonably anticipated as a legal standard, even if Sedona uses credible, is that standard likely to hold up? Um, yeah, you know, you raise a really good question uh, regarding this issue about um, uh, reasonably anticipated. And in fact, it, I'm glad you reminded me, there, is, there are proposed changes to the rules of, of civil procedure, federal rules of civil procedure. And in fact, they were just released uh, yesterday, and they're out there for comment. So you do have a great opportunity to comment on, um, on the, the, the proposed rules. Um, in terms of credibly probable, um, yes, Sedona just proposes it. It doesn't necessarily mean that it has to be adopted. Uh, but if I'm recalling correctly, there is at least one case out there that is using that standard of, of credibly probable. Um, 
my book is, is due for updating because we wrote it back in 2009, and these are some of the issues that we're going to be addressing uh, in the book. So great question. <clears throat> All right, so now let's jump into each of these steps, and um, I'll try to walk through these relatively quickly because I think I really gave you a good oversight uh, in, in the previous slide. So the first step is to identify whether a triggering event has occurred. And I'm going to now give you some examples of different cases and co what courts have held to be considered a, a triggering event. So if you go back to the Zubulay case, uh, which was a case that uh, Mrs. Zubulay brought against UBS Warburg uh, for um, gender discrimination, um, and in that case, um, uh, the court held that the duty to preserve arose at the latest when Mrs. Zubulay filed a claim with the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. So if you are in a situation where a claim has been filed with a local agency, that should be a given that it's a triggering event for you to start a, uh, litigation, a preservation hold. Along those lines, and I know uh, Alon has some, uh, some choice uh, examples around this, the, what I call water cooler discussions. And in, in Zubulake, uh, the, the court, Judge Scheinlein basically said, look, just because one or two employees contemplate the possibility that a fellow employee might sue doesn't necessarily impose a firm-wide duty to preserve. But in a situation where, to, where it appears that really almost everyone associated with this employee recognized the possibility that she might sue, then that rises to the level of a triggering event. And Alon, I think you mentioned um, that uh, you, you've come across this issue of, of water cooler discussions before. So if you want to elaborate. Yeah, sure. Um, specifically, we had a case where the uh, different divisions inside of a particular company were starting to see that products were being returned. And so, uh, you know, it, it started to come in drips and drabs, and it came kind of in, in, in larger scale, and then uh, certain distributors were actually not even ordering a particular products because, and so you know, in that case, um, we, you know, it was determined by the court that that was enough for the company to have uh, anticipated that there was going to be an issue. In that case, unfortunately, they hadn't. Uh, I wasn't involved yet at that point, so maybe if I had, I would I would have given them that advice. Um, and, uh, and we were able to still uh, kind of show some, some good faith efforts in, in order to ensure that documents were not deleted. Uh, but specifically on this point, if you have something that is uh, almost systematic in that case, so it, it's kind of water cooler in that it's not really formal. There hasn't been a complaint issued or anything like that. But there's enough going on across the organization to at least give the legal department something to think about to give, give people pause that, hey, maybe there's something wrong with this product if we keep getting a bunch of these back. So that was kind of the situation that we were working with. And this really relates to one of the questions that's come up here on the, on the chat board. Um, the question of, of determining specifically whether a duty to preserve has, has arisen um, really is something that you need to vet with your counsel. Uh, if you notice that something is out there, and that's the purpose of having that, that oversight committee, you, you're constantly monitoring. So follow your gut on that one. If, if there's something that's, that's occurring, it's not anything that where people, any one person is going to say, yeah, it's time to issue a hold. It's something that you may want to decide on committee and definitely involved with your, with your counsel, the, the litigation counsel that's in charge of that particular lawsuit, or your in-house counsel uh, to ultimately make the decision of whether or not something needs to, a uh, 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 hold needs to be issued. Um, another obvious instance, and this is what I was referring to earlier, with it, there are instances where you may be the plaintiff in the case. And in, in this case, in Silvestri versus General Motors, this, this is what I would call no insult to Mr. Mr. Silvestri and his counsel, but this is a nincompoop case. Um, if you are suing an automobile company for a defect in your vehicle, do not allow your vehicle to be destroyed. Okay, because it's a it's basically a formula for General Motors going to the to the court and saying, Your Honor, how are we supposed to defend ourselves when this vehicle is has been destroyed? So in this instance, uh, Silvestri's case was it was dismissed because he allowed the vehicle uh, to be um, uh, destroyed 
um, and the court determined that once he had retained two accident experts and counsel, it was considered anticipation of filing a lawsuit. So if you're at the point where you're already retaining experts in anticipation of defense of a lawsuit or in anticipation of a lawsuit, it means that a triggering event has occurred. Or if you are in a position where you are retaining counsel and you start talking to counsel about time to, ta time to draft a complaint and so on and so forth, that could be considered a, a triggering event. Um, another uh, uh, opinion that I mentioned earlier is this s set of Rambis decisions where basically Rambis decided that they were going to be battle ready. Um, they were tired of people infringing on their technology and not paying for it. So they were just going to be battle ready and they were going to start having um, – uh, get ready to to file lawsuits against anybody that was infringing upon their their um, their patents. Where they went wrong was that they, in, in making themselves battle ready, they held what were called office shred days, and um, and uh, created a records and information management policy designed around this whole litigation and battle readiness strategy. The courts in uh, Virginia on the East Coast really found the timing of, of all of this to be suspicious, whereas the court in California didn't really see enough of a nexus. So this is a very interesting set of, of cases because they deal with the exact same facts, yet you have different jurisdictions that are interpreting the same facts completely differently. Um, so one of the things to keep in mind is obviously what jurisdiction you're in, uh, but also the bottom line is if you're going to be uh, in anticipating that you're going to be filing lawsuits uh, to protect your patents or against anybody else, don't kind of do it at the same time as, as a very active uh, records management uh, implementation and have shred days where you're celebrating and giving awards to people that destroy the most information. And I, I know this sounds ridiculous, but I've actually seen it where people have had contests for who has more, the most information that they've destroyed, and obviously that's just uh, fodder for, for your opposing counsel. So that was a step number two. So you've determined whether or not there's a triggering event. The book goes into a lot more detail about other, uh, other types of triggering events. And if you don't want to buy the book, you can always download uh, free copies of two studies that I did for the ARMA Educational Foundation on these issues, um, armaed.org. You can download a 2004 study and a 2007 study that I did around this issue of um, anticipated legal holds, particularly the 2007 study. Once you've determined if, if, if uh, a legal hold needs to be issued, then it's time to de de define the scope of the hold. And so the next few, few slides will go a little bit faster. Um, the scope uh, needs to, to include really anything that's in your systems, and it could include um, uh, system log data. And, um, and I know that it sounds really crazy when I talk about system log data, but um, uh, I'll bring you to this, to, to this actual case, Columbia Pictures versus Bunnell. And in this case, um, Columbia Pictures was bringing a lawsuit against Bunnell and, and others uh, for copying right infringement. Basically, Columbia Pictures was saying, look, I'm tired of people, of, of, of people that are downloading our movies and not paying for, for, their, for the rights to, 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 to sell those movies. And um, the court in that instance held that there was a duty to preserve the, uh, the, uh, the information um, and that there, there could have been a, a failure to preserve uh, the, um, the information. But where it got interesting was that Columbia Pictures requested uh, system log data. They wanted the IP addresses of the users that were using the defendant's website. Uh, they wanted .torrent files, and they wanted the dates and times and, of the request, which makes sense because Columbia Pictures wanted to set basically the exact time and exactly how many people and how many uh, licenses were, were being violated. Um, what happened then was that the court basically, the, ben Benel came back and said, look, um, we are in France. Um, we uh, do not enable those functions in France because of privacy concerns. Therefore, we cannot provide the information. Um, and the court said, wait a minute, wait a minute, not so fast. 
at some point you had to have known when the data, who the, who the people were that you were sending the information to, even if it was uh, it stored in RAM or, or random access memory for the last six hours. So we think that that would be considered a discoverable information. Where Columbia Pictures went wrong, and not that we would fault them, is that um, they did not specifically request information temporarily stored in RAM. So Bunnell got a sort of a, a free pass on this one, but the bottom line is that the court held that random access memory does qualify as electronically stored information, and um, it, it would be considered within the custody or control of the defendants, whether in their servers or their partner servers, because one of the arguments Bunnell was making was, well, we have several vendors that we work with, and they're our partners, and therefore we don't have control over their data. And the court in this instance said, oh, no, you don't. You do have control over their data. Um, this doesn't mean that all data that is temporarily stored in RAM has to be preserved, but certainly the facts of your case could lead you to have to make those very tough decisions. Um, I'll skip this slide because it it's basically elaborates what I already mentioned earlier. Um, step number four is to implement the hold. And in implementing the hold, you need to decide who is going to issue the hold order. Is it going to be from a high enough level person within the organization that's going to have credibility when the hold is issued? Is it going to come from that committee that I recommend you, you, you create for your organization? And depending on the size of the organization, you could have committees and subcommittees, a, a huge oversight committee, and then subcommittees for maybe different types of litigation. Um, who is the order going to come from? I would not recommend that it come from the CEO because the CEO has much more important things to do or from somebody at that super high C level, but certainly from, from in-house counsel uh, that would hold some credibility. Uh, as far as who receives the hold order, then, that then goes back to the issue of, of scope. And <clears throat> there are two schools of thought on whether or not you need to broadcast the hold to the entire organization. On the one hand, it might be good to broadcast a hold to the entire uh, organization to, be, to ensure uh, complete defensibility. Uh, but on the other hand, if it's a uh, very um, sensitive matter, say HR matters or, or uh, trade secret types of, types of things, um, or things that if they got out into the public, it might, be, it might not be a good idea, um, then you, you're going to have to really monitor who the hold um, is uh, sent to. Um, you're going to have to have uh, forms for what the hold order did, so you'll have to have uh, content. The book provides um, some samples, and there are some tools out there that already provide forms that, that can be uh, pre-filled out, um, uh, such as the tool that, uh, that BIA offers and, and other uh, vendors like that. Um, you want to coordinate uh, with IT. You want to sit down with IT and make sure that they understand this process. Don't just pay lip service to it. You've got to sit out, get out there and talk with ID, IT and make sure that they're involved in the discussions. Uh, you're going to have to analyze your data map uh, and um, look to see whether or not uh, within your data map, and, and when I talk about data map, I don't mean data map that means only something to IT, which is to many of us would just be a bunch of gobbledygook. Uh, what I mean by data map is something that a layperson can read and understand for what's contained within your systems. And then, of course, you're going to go out there and interview uh, key witnesses. Step number five, you're going to enforce and examine the effectiveness of the hold. You're going to continue those interviews with those witnesses to make sure that they, that they get the information. You're going to get together with IT to make sure that they've, they're following the protocol and following your instructions. And you're going to consult with that hold oversight committee um, to see if there's any, uh, been any broadening uh, or any narrowing of the legal hold uh, or alternative consult with, with counsel on that. Uh, you're going to modify the legal hold. Obviously, you're going to recheck the scope for distribution, uh, if it's broader or narrower. Um, have any custodians been added, not necessarily because they're new parties, but because of the, the broadening of maybe the scope, or maybe through discovery you're finding out that there might be other people that have um, uh, relevant information. Um, you're going to be very mindful of, of court orders because sometimes the court orders may have very specific instructions 
on exactly what needs to be produced uh, and or maybe even kind of limiting the scope of what needs to be uh, produced. And then, of course, um, you're going to mo have to modify accordingly. And then finally, under step seven, you're going to monitor and remove the legal hold. Uh, monitoring means that you're going to be auditing to make sure that this process is, is working. You're going to send uh, legal hold reminders or record hold reminders, which, as I mentioned earlier, tools such as a, a launch tool um, will, will aut automate for you. Um, issuance to new employees is, is really important uh, uh, because when we talk about new employee, we're not just talking about anybody that's new to the company, but maybe somebody that's been promoted within the company that is now within your department. Um, and so to that extent, you need to make sure that you track what's, what's been happening to, to the employee data. Um, and that kind of relates to that fifth bullet here, uh, the terminated employees. And I can't emphasize enough how important it is to track the data of those terminated employees, um, terminated because they've left the company or terminated because they're no longer within one particular department and they've been promoted or moved to a different department. You're going to have to track that data. You're going to have to track their laptops and, and uh, make sure that you don't just purge the data in their laptops when they've left. You've got to absolutely stop to monitor and make sure that there are no, there's no data within those laptops or any other, other portable devices that could be responsive to a, to a legal hold. And then as I mentioned earlier, you want to avoid that cascading legal hold dilemma by deleting, by not, um, by deleting data as soon as the legal hold is lifted. If you attend any of the panels with judges, they're, they're, uh, they will always ask, I just don't understand why these people are keeping all this data. So part of this whole seven-step process and part of really an overall information governance and information management program is to have a legally defensible program that you can use for disposing of data in accordance with the law uh, while at the same time not overcrowding your system with stuff that's going to wind up being produced to your opposing counsel at six, uh, to your counsel at $600 an hour just so that they can determine if it's relevant or not. And certainly the judges would be very frustrated by that. So that really kind of really summarizes uh, the, 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 my seven steps here and really what, what this is all about. It's all about the big picture. And at this point, I think we'll turn it over to, uh, I guess, uh, Robin to monitor some of the questions. And, um, and here's our contact information. Um, my email address is here. If you're interested in the book, just uh, email me or, or email Alon, and I'll make sure that, that you get a book or at least send you a link for how to order the book. And uh, Alon and I will be presenting um, a step-by-step uh, -step approach to developing legal holds on October 27th in Las Vegas at the ARMA conference. A free copy of the book will be handed out with that presentation, and in that presentation we'll be conducting an actual workshop uh, where we're going to be demonstrating tools that could be used to put the, the legal holds. So I think it will be a very fun uh, conference. So turn it over to you, Robin. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, yeah, I have, a, I have a few questions for you all. Um, uh, either one, how soon after issuing a legal hold should I be collecting data? Oh, good question. How soon after issuing the legal hold should you be collecting the data? Um, hmm. It really depends on the nature of the, of the lawsuit. Um, certainly, the courts have said as soon as reasonably possible, okay? But unfortunately, for those of us that have gone to law school, the word reasonable is one heck of a headache. So basically, reasonably po possible means um, that you have to stop and analyze the context of the lawsuit, the urgency of the matter, and say, for example, in a patent infringement type of case or, or copyright protection case, um, analyzing and thinking about, say, uh, that Columbia Pictures case, is there, some, is there something in here that involves temporary d data sitting in, in RAM? Um, so the sensitivity of the matter, so bottom line, it depends on, on the facts of the case. Okay, Alon, i uh, got one for you. We sometimes get notice of a suit where a product we manufacture and design is involved in a case, but we don't know what product or any other details. Do we have to issue a legal hold at that time? 
Uh, Alon did not hear the question because I had not put it on speaker. So uh, what was the question again? Sure, let me restate it. We sometimes get notice of a suit where a product we manufacture and design is involved in a case, but we don't know what product or any other data. Do we have to issue a legal hold at that time? Uh, yeah, I'll let John answer this uh, probably better than me because it's about the scope and, and, and identification. But you know, I think it's always better to err on the side of issuing a hold. Maybe it's a more narrow focus. Maybe you don't have to issue to the entire organization. Maybe just the product managers or, or, or people involved at that level. Uh, but I would say just you know, just off the top of my head, you're better off erring on the side of issuing a hold. You can always pull it away once you determine that it's either not enough information or, or it's not real. Yeah, and in fact, this goes back to one of the questions that was raised earlier, and really one of the things that the courts um, are tr that the uh, re revised federal rules of civil procedure are, uh, which are being proposed right now, are looking to address, which is. Um, once and for all kind of trying to make it clear when those legal holds need to be issued because this is really one of those gray areas. Um, one of the things, one of the considerations that the court is, is willing to consider is how crippling it would be for the organization. If it's going to be something that's going to cripple the organization, they're not going to force you to uh, expect you to have issued a, a legal hold, although mm, don't quote me on that. It, de it depends on what jurisdiction you're in. Um, but you're going to have to, again, consult with your, with your committee, consult with your counsel as to whether or not they think that this rises to the level of a, a triggering event. And certainly, if you have no idea what the product is and that kind of stuff, uh, you're gonna, you, you can definitely issue a very narrow hold to at least show good faith compliance, and you can always broaden it later. So as Alon pointed out, yeah, I would err on the side of, of safety, even if it's a very narrow legal hold, but that it at least shows that, that you're trying to comply with the process. And, and I'll, I'll answer the first question with respect to collections in the same way. You're better off erring on getting the data gathered or collected as soon as you can after a hold is issued. Um, again, it could be more narrow. Maybe you get the key custodian's data collected first, but to the extent you can preserve the data, uh, now that is, could be very complicated uh, and it costs a lot of time and money in some organizations, which is one of the reasons you want to look into some uh, pro processes or, or solutions earlier so that when you do need to act fast, whether it's issuing the legal hold or, ish or, or uh, doing a, a collection or a gathering, that you have a means of doing so that doesn't, um, doesn't cause a lot of agita or break the bank. Perfect. Well, we've run right up to um, our time, and it's, we, we have other questions, but what I'd like to do is invite our participants to join us for part two, which will be August 29th. As you leave today, if you have not already registered for that, we will be giving you a link. Uh, don't forget to write John or Education at BIA Protect to take advantage of getting a 10% discount on John's book as a uh, thank you for being a loyal BIA webinar attendant. And lastly, I would like to thank our distinguished speakers for taking valuable time out of their day to share education with us so that we can be better at what we do as part of this industry. John, Alon, thank you so much. Well, thank you. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, guests. Ladies and gentlemen, this does conclude the webinar for today. We thank you for your participation and ask that you please disconnect your lines.